Hey everyone, Mr. Fransky here. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Lagrange error bound, which is, um, I feel like this way about all the chapter 9 sections, but I think this is one of the most important sections that's in here. Uh, it's something that AP asks about a lot, um, and it's just being able to find the error between a Taylor series and the actual value of a function. Uh, Lagrange, surprise, surprise, another famous mathematician that had a lot to do with the development of calculus and especially uh, work with series. So uh, let's take a look here. So we're going to start with um, what you learned in the last uh, section, which is error in a geometric series. So hopefully you have this um, at least a little bit under control now. So I'm going to do this problem with you. So first we're going to find the order 5 McLaurin series, P5 of X, for F of X equals 1 over 1 minus 2X squared. Then we're going to find the error for any X you choose in the interval. And then uh, we're going to see if 0.6 is in the interval, and we're going to compare it to the error formula. So I do have a hint right here. Um, that's This is a special form. So one trap that calculus students fall into at this point is they seem the word McLaurin and they start taking derivatives. They do first derivative, second derivative. We should have to go through five derivatives if we do it that way, right? But my hint here is that this is a special form. We've seen this before. You shouldn't have to do any derivatives because this should be, this looks like in the A over 1 minus R form. Right, So this is a geometric series, so we're going to be able to do this without having to take any derivatives. It'll work out the same way, but it's just a lot less work. All right, And then we're also asked for the interval of convergence, which we can do because that should just be absolute value of r is less than 1. So let's see how this goes. So first thing they ask us to do is just find the order 5 McLaurin series. That means it has to be have an x to the fifth in it somewhere. McLaurin means centered at 0. Um, and all geometrics, unless you uh, start to... Um, try to change this to like x minus 1 or something, they're going to be centered at 0. So 1 over 1 minus 2x squared. It looks like our a value here is 1. It looks like our r is just 2x squared. So it looks like if we write out this to 5 terms, or to the 5th power, it looks like it's going to be um, 1, and then plus 2x squared, and then plus 4x cubed. Right, because we just keep multiplying by 2x squared, not cubed, 4th, thank you. Okay, and uh, then the next one would be plus 8x to the 6th, and the next one would be uh, 16x to the 8th, right? And this would keep going. Now, what were we asked for? We're asked for the order 5 McLaurin series. So we want this to go to x to the 5th power. Well, what's wrong with that? There is no x to the 5th power, right? Well, technically, there sort of is, right? What would be right here? I think there would be a 0x to the 5th. So technically, if we stop this at the 4th power, that is going to be the order 5 McLaurin series. So let's get rid of everything else here. Okay, so this would be true uh, if it kept adding. In fact, I should, uh, let's just leave one more there. I x to the 6 plus dot, dot, dot. So then the p5, p5 of x. So this is true if, if you keep going to infinity, right? As long as absolute 2x squared is less than 1. p5 of x then is going to be 1 plus 2x squared plus 4x to the 4th. It's going to stop there because you have to stop at the 5th degree. Technically, there's a 0x to the 5th here, but I'm not going to write that. And so that is where our... Uh, our series stops, or our, our polynomial. So that is the fifth degree polynomial. And this is going to be true when absolute 2x squared is less than 1. Let's see if we can solve that. So that means negative 1 has to be less than 2x squared less than positive 1. Shouldn't be any trouble being greater than negative 1 because we have a square, so it should be positive. Divide by 2, so negative 1 half less than x squared less than 1 half. Now, we take the square root. At this point, we know this is going to be positive, so I'm not going to worry about taking the square root of a negative number because I know at this point that really means that, um, that x squared is between uh, 0 and 1 half. But if I take the square root, um, and really the issue here is with the absolute value, but if I take the square root, this means that x has to be between negative 1 over the square root of 2 and 1 over the square root of 2. Now, some of you may have seen this before. If you rationalize it, multiply by root 2 over root 2, this means that x has to be between negative root 2 over 2 and positive root 2 over 2. Very famous numbers, especially in uh, math team problems. So if x is between negative root 2 and root 2 over 2, let's think about what would happen here. If you squared x, if you squared x, that means that x would be less than 1 half. It'd actually be between 1 half and 0, right? Because if you square that negative value, it's going to give you a positive. And then when you multiply it by 2, it's going to be between negative 1 and 1. Okay? So that's our interval of convergence. All right. So now they ask, what is the error formula for any x you choose in your interval? So like we said, 1 over 1 minus 2x squared should be equal to 1 plus 2x squared plus 4x to the 4th plus 8x to the 6th plus 16x to the 8th, etc., etc. We stopped at 4x to the 4th. So how much is the error? Well, it's everything else, right? And everything else creates a new geometric series. So as long as... Um, I guess I can write absolute x is but less than uh, root 2 over 2. So as long as this is true, um, then your error 
if you just like if you plug in like um, I don't know, like 0.1 in for x here, and you plug 0.1 in for x here, the difference is going to be the rest of the series, which is uh, a series with a first term of 8x to the 6th, and we're still multiplying by 2x squared every time. So that is the error formula because it's geometric, right? The rest of it will be still geometric, and it's going to be the error. So now they ask if 0.6 is in our interval. Well, root 2 over 2, you might not know this, it's about 0.707. So yes, yes it is. 0.6 is indeed in our interval. And so they ask us what f of 0.6 is and what p5 of 0.6 is. And we want to see if our error formula is right. So let's check it out. So f of 0.6, f of 0.6 is just 1 over 1 minus 2 times 0.6 squared. And I'm going to grab a calculator to do that. I think I have one ready to go. Let's go back to the slide because it keeps moving on me. So let's see what our calculator says for that. Get that in here somewhere. There we go. So if I do uh, 1 over parentheses, 1 minus 2 times 0. 0.6 to the second. That looks exactly how I want it. That is 3.57143. So we have 3.57143. P5 of 0. 0.6. For that, I'm just going to plug it in for the x's on the, the polynomial. So it's going to be 1 plus 2 times 0. 0.6 squared plus 4 times 0. 0.6 cubed. Let's figure out what that is. So I'm going to do, um, this might be a good opportunity to use a store button. So I'm going to do 0.6 store, remember is control and then var right up there. So I'm going to store that for x. And it's going to tell me it's done. Now I'm just going to do 1 plus 2x squared. Notice it's bold. Plus 4x to the fourth. Control enter. It gives me 2.38284. So 2.2384. Two so the difference here should be made up by this error or by this error formula. So let's find out what that difference is. So I'm just going to subtract these two values. So grab this guy, subtract this guy. Gives me 1.3303. How many threes are there? Three threes. 1.3303. If they ask you for the error, make sure you're to three decimal places. Now let's see if that works when I plug 0.6 in here. Now I already have it stored for x. So I'm going to do 8x to the sixth divided by 1 minus 2 times 0.6 squared. I always hold my breath on this because I'm hoping it's going to be right. And there it is. It is indeed uh, evaluated at 0 0.6. This is equal to uh, 1.3303. So this is kind of unique for three threes. <laughs> this is kind of unique for a uh, geometric series that you can actually find the exact error. That's very rare. Uh, but it's cool because it's so easy to find the rest of the geometric series, right? It's not too bad. All right, so that's great for geometric. But what about uh, Taylor series, right? So if we think about the Taylor series for e to the x, or the Maclaurin series, I guess you could also call it, for e to the x. Let's think about what that is. So you should have this hopefully memorized by now. If not, you should be on your way. So e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, x to the 4th over 4 factorial, and we keep adding on and on and on. Now the problem here is, well, this is not a geometric series, right? If I stop at like the third order Taylor polynomial, the question is, what is all this error going to add up to over here? So let's say I wanted to approximate like e to the, I don't know, fourth power. So if I say e to the fourth power is 1 plus 4 plus 4 squared over 2 factorial plus 4 cubed over 3 factorial, that's not going to be true, right? These two sides are not going to be equal to each other because there's going to be some error. If you went off to infinity, we have seen just by looking at a graph that it looks like this thing actually converges for any real number. So if you add it off to infinity, e to the fourth should be equal to 1 plus 4 plus 4 squared over 2 factorial plus 4 cubed over 3 factorial plus 4 to the fourth over 4 factorial all the way off to infinity. That is an exact equality. But if we stop, the question is, what the heck is this error going to be? Because we haven't really encountered this yet. So um, the question is, how can we do that? And this is where Taylor's theorem comes into play. So this is definitely an important one. You definitely want to make sure you have this in your notes. So this is what Taylor's theorem says. The nth order Taylor polynomial at x equals a, and it could be centered at 0. Remember, that's called a Maclaurin series. There we go. I kind of squished the U in there. Okay, Maclaurin series. Remember, that's just uh, f of x, or uh, let's call it tx. Okay, so t sub n of x. So if we stop at the nth term. So t n of x, remember, is just f of 0 plus f prime of 0x, or a, I should use a because I said it's centered at a. So f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a times x minus a squared over 2 factorial, 
plus, um, I'm just going to do dot, 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 dot here, and I'll end at n. So the nth derivative evaluated at a times x minus a to the nth power divided by n factorial. So we said Taylor polynomial, so it's going to stop there. It is not going to have dot, dot, dots at the n. It is stopping at n. So now the question is, what is the rest of it? Right? If you were to go off to infinity, how much is missing? Okay? So the exact error, this is what Taylor, Taylor's theorem says. The error is exactly the next derivative. So n plus 1 evaluated at a. So you take the next derivative divided by n plus 1 factorial. And basically this just looks like the next term, right? Times x minus a to the n plus 1. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to change this a to a c. Okay? And I'll tell you why that is in a second. Because if it was just the next term, that'd be too easy, right? If it was just the next term plugging in a, it'd be like, oh, that's easier than geometric almost, because you can just plug in one value. And uh, this is called the Lagrange remainder. Often they do it r sub n. Okay, this is called the Lagrange, Lagrange remainder. r for remainder. There we go. Okay, so Lagrange remainder after this famous mathematician named Lagrange. And um, that is for some c between c between x and a. Okay, now this is important, and this is what often confuses people. Okay, so what they're saying is you're centered at a, right? You're centered at a. So let's say a is like 3, and um, you're trying to find f of like 7. Okay, so what this says is if you take the next derivative of some number between 3 and 7, and then you multiply by x minus a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, like just like we normally do it for a Taylor series. There's some c between 3 and 7. Maybe it's 4.3, maybe, um, maybe it's 7, maybe it's like 5.1, maybe it's 3.2. We don't know what the c value is, but the point of Taylor theorem is that there is some c value between 3 and 7, where if you plug it into the n plus first derivative, so the next derivative after you stop your derivatives for the Taylor, uh, for the Taylor polynomial, and then you multiply by x minus a, so in this case 7 minus 3 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial, there is some c value that makes this the exact rest of the error. You are usually more interested, you're not usually interested in the actual c value. I have never seen, I have never seen, doesn't mean it could never happen, but I have never seen AP ask for the c value. So you are never asked for the actual c value. The important thing is that it exists somewhere. This pen is not working well. You're never asked for c. Okay, what you are usually more interested in, if this would stop jumping all over the place for me, what you're usually more interested in is, uh, is the bound for the error. Okay, you're more interested in the bound for the error. What that means is you don't really care what the exact error is, you worry how bad could it be? How bad could it be? Okay, we'll kind of talk about why that's the most important thing as we go through some more examples here, okay? But the question is, how bad could this be? I can't believe this keeps jumping around on me. I'm sorry. Okay, so how bad could it be? Um, and so in the case, usually, I, I don't want to say always because it's not always, but usually it's one of the two endpoints. If you plug one of the two endpoints into the n plus first derivative, it'll be the biggest possible value that you could have because you're really interested in, if I stop at this point, what's the worst that the error could be? And generally, you want that to be small, right? So you usually go off to enough terms that your error is as small as you want. Okay, so that was a lot of theory. Let's kind of put it into practice here. So what exactly does that mean? So we think about our Taylor polynomial. f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a times x minus a squared over 2 factorial. We keep going until we stop at the nth term. So n times a, nah, sorry, nth derivative of a over n factorial times x minus a to the n. If we stop there, if we stop there, what Taylor's theorem says is the rest of it can all be defined by this n plus first derivative of c over n plus 1 factorial. So it's like the next term. It's very important that you realize it's like the next term after you would have stopped. So you just kind of need to go one term further. Times x minus a to the n plus 1 for some c on the interval uh, between x and a. Okay, now x could be bigger than a or x could be smaller than a, so we should probably write it both ways, right? Okay, or ax, right? It's, it's somewhere um, between the values of x and a. Usually I just write between x and a because then it covers both, between x and a. Okay, so the rest of this is actually equal to that. That's kind of like what we saw back when we did our geometric 
right? So we said uh, the rest of the series could actually equal this value. So there is some value. The difference is we can't just rely on x. It has something to do with x and a, and it differs for every series. So we can't really find it, okay? All right, so let's try an example. We're going to try to figure out what this error is, and we're going to show that this works, okay? Because I want to convince you. So what we're going to do here is find the order of formula chlorine polynomial for f of x equals e to the x. That's not too bad. It's just 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. That's a bad factorial. Let's try it again. Okay, so this is the fourth order McLaurin series for, um, or McLaurin polynomial for uh, e to the x. You should have that memorized. So I'm going to use that to approximate e cubed. So e cubed, I'm going to do a squiggly equal sign because this is not going to be true, but it's approximately 1 plus 3 plus 3 squared over 2 factorial plus 3 to the third over 3 factorial plus 3 to the fourth over 4 factorial. And now we can use a hard equal sign because I'm actually going to do that on my calculator. Here we are. So I'm going to do, uh, let's just do 3, store it for x. I'm going to do store for x. And I'm going to do 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial. There is a factorial button. Um, I believe it's in menu, probability, whoops, and then factorial. It's number 1, okay? You I can also just, I think, hit exclamation point. I think it's in here with the pi. No, nope, it's not there, but there's one somewhere. I know if you look around a little bit, you're going to find one. And it might be in here. Nope, not there either. So you can hunt around for it if you want to, but I'm just going to kind of keep going here. So we're going to do plus x to the third over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. And that gives me 16.375. That is not e cubed, right? But it's an approximation for e cubed using the uh, fourth degree or fourth order to McLaurin polynomial for e to the x. So now what they want to ask is, what is the error bound? What is the error bound for valuing e cubed using your polynomial? Well, let's go back to our remainder. So they tell us the remainder is going to be the next derivative, n plus 1, uh, of a. Okay, and in this case, we're centered at 0, right? Because we're using McLaurin. Okay, divided by... Um, yeah, think about this here. It's going to be divided by n plus 1, not a, c. I was thinking something that sounded weird with that. Okay, n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1. I'm going to try to close my a's so I don't have my c's. All right. So uh, let's kind of plug in what we know here. So I'm going to leave the n plus 1 c thing up there. So we have f n plus 1 c divided by n plus 1, so that's going to be 5 factorial times x minus a, so that's going to be 3 minus 0 to the n plus 1, which in this case is 5, okay? So this is for some c that is on the interval between uh, 0 and 3, right? Somewhere between my center, which is 0, and my value that I'm using for x, which is 3. So there's some c value that makes this the exact error. I'm asked for the bound. So what I'm thinking here is between 0 and 3, which one of these is going to make this the biggest possible? Well, what's the n plus first derivative? Any derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, right? So this is e to the c divided by 5 factorial times 3 minus 0 to the 5th, right? Because the n plus first derivative is just e to the x. It's always e to the x, right? So now what I have to think is between 0 and 3, what is the worst case scenario? Which one is going to give me the biggest possible error? Well, I think if I use 3, that's going to give me the biggest possible error. Right? Because if I do e to the 0, that's 1. If, e, if the uh, c value gets bigger, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to find the maximum. So the maximum is going to be, tell me how big the error could possibly be. So that's going to be e cubed over 5 factorial times 3 to the 5th power. Let's do that on our calculator. Okay? So we're going to do e, got to do the thing over here. So we're going to do e to the 3rd divided by 5 factorial. And I'm going to multiply that by uh, 3 to the 5th power. Do control enter. Let's see what we get. We get 40.6732. Go back to what I want. Okay, that's 40.6732. Okay, so that is the error bound for finding x cubed using uh, four terms. It is not the correct error, right? But I know that it can't be worse than that because the, the actual c value has got to be somewhere between 0 and 3. And I used the one that gave me the biggest possible value. Okay, so now I also want to talk about this just real quick. What would the error bound be for e to the negative 2? Well, negative 2, I'll kind of do it over here. So we'd have e to the c still, because the n plus first derivative is always e to the c, divided by 5 factorial still. Now this time I have negative 2 minus 0, right? x minus a raised to the fifth power. Now, c is somewhere, 
on the interval from negative 2 to 0. Which one makes it the worst? This time it's not the x value, it's actually 0, right? So the maximum for this would be 1 over 5 factorial times negative 2 to the 5th. Okay? And oftentimes we're really worried about the positive. This is going to be a negative number, and the sign actually does carry through, but AP almost always asks for what is the absolute error bound, something like that. So if we do that, um, and why did I use 1? Because e to the 0 is the biggest possible value of e to the c between negative 2 and 0. So if we do that, let's do it, why not? So we got 1 over 5 factorial times e, sorry, uh, negative 2 to the 5th. So I'm just going to do 2 to the 5th because I'm concerned about the absolute value. It gives me 0. 0.26667. So that's 0. 0.2666. Okay. And we'll see that in the next slide. It's going to be much more important. So 0. 0.2666. That's a much uh, better error bound, right? This is pretty huge. So let's find the actual error. So the value that we got was 16.375. We're going to subtract from that e cubed. So e cubed, i got to actually figure out what that is on my calculator. I'm going to do the absolute value because I don't really care if it's positive or negative. I want to see if it's smaller than the bound that we found. Okay, so I'm going to go over here. I'm going to do 16.375, which I think I still have in here somewhere. And I'm going to subtract from that e to the third power. So I'm going to do e over on the left here to the third. Do control enter. It gives me negative 3.710. So I'm going to do the absolute value, 3.710. Is that less than, my goodness, is that less than, uh, what was it, 40.67? Yes, indeed it was, right? So as you can see, we really overcompensate sometimes, especially as the numbers get big. Um, all that we need to know is, is this, what's the worst possible case? And for, in this case, for sure, our error is smaller than that. Okay. So now this is an important one because everyone always asks me this. So what is the solution in the real world where knowing the bound is more important than knowing the actual error? Let's say you're building a bridge. Okay. We had a big um, bridge crash on I-35 back in, I think it was 2010 or 2011. Um, and calculus actually came into some of the analysis for why the bridge collapsed. And it just makes me sad because I think if people would think about these things, like maybe these things wouldn't happen. I don't know. Anyway. So usually when you create a bridge or any kind of a structure, there's always some error tolerances. So let's say that like the bridge has to expand, okay? Because when things get hot, they expand. When things get cold, they contract, right? So you have these things called expansion joints that are in bridges. And I'm not saying this is why the 35 bridge collapsed. I don't know why it did, but um, you know, this is just something that you have to think about when you're doing something like this. So what you might say is that the bridge could expand, let's say up to like six inches. But then what you'll say is that there's an error tolerance on that because I'm not sure that it's going to expand six inches, right? But I might be sure that it's going to expand six inches plus or minus, let's say, three inches. Oh my goodness. Plus or minus three inches. Okay? Now, I want that to be as big as I feel comfortable saying, right? I don't want to, if I think, I think it's maybe two inches. Nope. I want to make sure that that's as big as possible because if this bridge expands, let's say nine inches, I want to make sure that the expansion joints are big enough for this to happen, right? If I say it's only six plus or minus one inch, or I say it's only going to expand six inches. That's really naive, right? Because we can't be 100% sure what's going to happen. So if I say it's only going to expand six inches and they only allow room for expansion of six inches on this bridge, then it's going to buckle and crack and collapse, right? So a lot of situations in the real world where you have to be overly safe. You have to be overly safe. You're not really sure exactly what's going to happen, but you have to say, you know, I know it's going to be less than this number for sure. Okay. So I used to make this chart on the board in class and it was huge and confusing and it took up a ton of time. So I just made it. And basically what I have here is um, one of them on here is actually the value that we should have just found to put uh, 0.2616 repeating. That should be on here somewhere. Uh, it should be the error bound. 26. Is it this one? I think I might have written it wrong. Was it 266? Yeah, yeah, that's a six. I thought that was a one. Okay. Now I was going to say, something's wrong here. Okay, so this is that error bound that we found for e to the negative two. I chose negative two because we have a, a alternating series then as we go bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and what I wanted to show is that this works for anything. So we did one calculation here, right? We did the calculation for e cubed, which is a big number, which is why that error bound was so big. And I just want to show that as you go, this error bound gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So let's see what happens with e to the negative two. So I have the partial sums of the uh, e to the x uh, expansion here. And then I plugged in negative 2 into each one of them. For just 1, it's just 1, right? Always. doesn't matter what you're plugging in. Um, 
I'm going to plug negative 2 into this guy, 1 minus 2, negative 1, plug negative 2 into this guy, 1 minus 2 plus 4 over 2. So we have negative 1 plus 2, which is positive 1, right? We just kind of go back and forth a little bit. Then we go to 3 terms, we get negative 1 third, 4 terms, 1 third, uh, positive 1 third. As we go here, notice that pretty quickly the values get pretty close to what we're looking for, right? We're already to two decimal places by the time we get to just um, a, uh, I guess that's supposed to be a 7th degree. Sorry about that. That should be a 7 or a 7. Okay. And... Um, so we can see it's converging very quickly. Why is that? Well, here I have the error, right? So what I did here is I took the polynomial value and subtracted the actual value, right? And I did the absolute value. So we found it's always positive, right? So the difference between 1 and 0.13 is 0.86, right? You can kind of convince yourself 86 plus 13, 99, plus a little bit of change is going to get you to 1, right? The difference between... Um, two terms and the value itself is 1.13, right? Because we're going from a negative one to a positive number, which should be more than one. So that actually went up a little bit. Now when we come back, we're back to one. Now we're back to the same error we had before. Now we have negative one, three. Our error is getting smaller, 0.46. Then our error is 0.19, then 0 0.06, 0 0.02, 0 0.005, right? We're really close by the time we get down to seven, uh, seventh degree or seventh order Taylor polynomial. So then what over here I did, and I said, okay, what is the error, right? The error should always be the n plus first derivative uh, evaluated at some c value divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1. So what I did was I said, okay, well, we stopped at a certain term over here. Gosh, this screen is so annoying. There we go. So we stopped a certain term over here. What I went, I went one further, right? So here we stopped at like five. I went one further. I went to six, right? Here I went to six. I went to seven. Here it went to seven. I went to eight. And what I did was I said, what is the biggest C value, or the C value that will create the biggest value for the derivative? Well, the m, m plus first derivative is just e to the x. So I want to think between negative two and zero, between negative two and zero, what value will give me the biggest possible error? Well, for all of those, it's zero, right? E to the zero is one. So 1 over 1 times negative 2 gives me absolute value is 2. Same thing here, right? And what we see is this error is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And double check that the actual error is less than the bound for all of them, right? Here it's less than 2. Here it's still less than 2. Here it's less than 1.33. 0. 0.46 is less than 0. 0.6. 0. 0.19 less than 0. 0.266. The point is, this value is often very difficult to get because we don't know the function value itself. But if I can say, well, I know it's less than this value, right? And these are all easy to get, right? E to the zero is one. These are easy to compute. Just use a calculator real quick, right? And as we see, this error bound is getting smaller, but our, our actual error is always smaller. Now over here, what I did, this is the part that I said AP never asks you to do, but I wanted to show you so that I could convince you that it's true. So what I did over here is I actually found the C value that makes this equal to the actual error, right? So here, what, where should this c value live? It should live between negative 2 and 0. So for this first one here, we see we have negative 0.838. That is indeed between negative 2 and 0. The next one, we have negative 0.566. That's between negative 2 and 0. In fact, all of these are actually between negative 1 and 0, which I found interesting. Uh, Taylor doesn't guarantee us anything about that. All it guarantees is that it's somewhere between um, the a value and the x value. So I found it for all of these because I care about you guys. I wanted to show you that it's actually true. And I kind of wanted to convince myself as well that there is some c value between negative 2 and 0, and this will always work. You do this for any value of e, any function, any function you want, you will always be able to find some c value um, that will get you to that exact error. All right. So what does this mean for convergence? Well, if we think about this error, if we go to more and more and more terms, so we have f of a plus f prime of a x minus a plus f double prime of a times x minus a squared over 2 factorial. If we keep adding, adding, adding through the nth term, uh, a times x minus a to the n over n factorial, and we keep adding. So the question is, eventually, do we converge, right? And we know it always converges at the center. So it's always going to converge at a, for sure. So at a, yes, right? And what we've seen now is we've seen some that converge around a certain interval, right? Like geometric, as long as your absolute of r is less than 1, it's going to converge. For sine, e to the x, and cosine, it's all real numbers, right? So the question is, why is that? Well, if it's going to converge, so whatever x value you're using, right? Because this depends on x, right? This depends on x. So for some x values, it's going to work. If x equals a, if x equals a, what is your error term always? Well, you have a minus a, that's 0. And the n plus 1, it's 0, right? So the error term will be 0 for whatever order you use, right? So if you're using it at the center, for sure it's going to work, right? But there are some x values where this, this, as you go to infinity, is going to be shrinking. There's somewhere it's going to be growing, and somewhere it's like oscillating. The point is, if... If the limit as n approaches infinity of r sub n is equal to 0, 
for some value of x. For some value of x. Then the series converges. Then the series converges. Now, let's talk about why that is. What this means is that as n gets bigger and bigger, if the error is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, this makes sense to me, right? If the error is turning into zero for whatever x value you've chosen, x equals a no-brainer, right? The question is, well, how about x equals like 0 0.01, right? For 0 0.01, um, uh, sorry, a plus 0 0.01, I guess you want to think about. So the difference here is 0 0.01. If it was McLaurin, it would just be 0 0.01. Uh, oh, goodness, I'm sorry. Okay, so for McLaurin, it'd be 0 0.01, but in any case, it'd be a plus 0 0.01. So if this is 0 0.01, if you take it bigger and bigger powers, is this thing going to win or is this thing going to win, right? You might end up with an infinity times zero situation where you might have to use L'Hopital, right? Um, but the question is, are there some values near x that work? When does it stop? And or does it work for all real numbers? So if the limit is zero for some value of x, then the series converges for that value of x. And usually what we're looking for is we're looking for some radius, x minus a, to be less than r. Okay, so we're looking for some radius of convergence where close to A, so like if A is like 2, maybe it's good between 1.5 to 2.5, right? Maybe between 1.5 and 2.5, that would mean absolute X minus 2 would have to be less than 0.5, right? The difference between X and 2 would have to be less than 0.5, something like that. This is kind of what we're going to be aiming for in 9.4 when we learn the ratio test, okay? All right. So now we get into what I think is kind of the fun stuff. So why is e to the x so special? We know e to the x converges for every real number x, right? We've seen this graph, right? If I zoom out a little bit, I guess I'm where I need to be. If we increase uh, the, the value uh, or the, the order of the Taylor polynomial, right? We know that it, if you keep going, it's going to get better and better and better. It's not between negative 1 and 1. It's all real numbers, right? If you go to infinity, this is going to keep getting better and better and better for any number, right? So the question is, why is it so special? Okay, and the answer is because of that error bound, right? So let's talk about why this happens. So um, if you think about the error, right? So if you think about the error for this guy, um, let's say that you're using whatever x value you want. So this guy is McLaurin. Okay, so this is McLaurin, so it's centered at a equals zero, right? So if you're doing like, I don't know, e to the uh, like fourth, Okay, so I say e to the fourth is going to be 1 plus 4 plus 4 squared over 2 factorial plus blah, 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 right? And what this says is if you stop somewhere, let's say we stop at like 4 to the seventh over 7 factorial, right? That means that the error at the worst case is going to be um, the n plus first derivative, which is e to the x. So it's going to be e to the c over 8 factorial times uh, 4 minus 0, because that's where it's centered, right? x minus a to the eighth power. Well, e to the c, right? e to the c, worst case scenario, between 0 and 4, is going to be 4, right? So this would be e to the 4th over 8 factorial times 4 to the 8th, okay? So for this, they say this is true for any x, okay? So this would, this would have to um, be true also for like e to the 17th times 17 to the 8th over 8 factorial, right? Um, and as you go bigger and bigger and bigger, what's going to happen here is think about the error formula. So Rn is going to be uh, e to the fourth, because that's going to be the, n the worst case nth derivative for whatever you have. Between 0 and 4, it's for sure always going to be e to the fourth. And then divided by n, factor n plus 1 factorial, excuse me, and then multiplied by um, 4 minus 0 to the n plus 1, right? So the question is, as n goes to infinity, what happens to this thing? And initially, you think, well, wait, we have 4 to the n plus 1. That's going to be getting really, really big. So the question is, does that grow faster than n plus 1 factorial? This is a constant, so I don't care about it. Pull it out to the front. So we have e to the fourth limit as n approaches infinity of just 4 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Well, let's think about what some of those terms are going to be. So as n gets big, so we would have like 4 to the 3rd over 3 factorial. Then we have 4 to the 4th over 4 factorial, 4 to the 5th over 5 factorial. And initially it seems, gee, 4 to the 5th, that's a really big number, right? 4 cubed is 64, 4 to the 4th is, um, what, uh, 256, right? So 4 to the 5th is going to be getting like 1024. These are getting really big. On the bottom here, 5 factorial is only like 120, right? It doesn't seem like it's going to win. But think about when you get to like like 4 to the, I don't know, um, let's say 18th over 18 factorial. Let's think about what kind of numbers are here. Here, this is 18 fours. 
On the bottom here, what kind of numbers are these? Well, the first numbers are small, right? 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, but then you get bigger. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, etc., etc., right? These numbers get really huge. That just went all the way to the end of my slideshow. I don't like that. Okay? Oh, goodness. Stop. <laughs> okay, so on the bottom what happens is we keep getting bigger and bigger numbers on the top We just keep adding fours So eventually what's going to happen is all of these are going to cancel out all the fours on the top But these numbers are going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger So no matter what value you have up here it doesn't matter if it's four or 17 or a million Eventually the uh, factory on the bottom is going to cancel it out. So this is going to turn into zero for any X and that, I think, is pretty incredible. Um, I have always been amazed at that, that factorial is going to grow faster than an exponential. But it's true. Um, no matter what x you have, that factorial is always going to win. And that's all you need to know for why e to the x is so special and why it converges. It's pretty cool. Sine and cosine, even easier. Watch this. So if I do, uh, let's say f of x is sine x. It works exactly the same for cosine. So if f of x is sine x, let's think about the n plus first derivative. Okay, so the derivative is cosine, right? And the second derivative is negative sine. The third derivative is uh, negative cosine. And the fourth derivative is um is just back to sine right so the point is no matter what derivative you stop at what is the n plus first derivative always going to look like of c well i don't really care right it's going to be sine of c or cosine of c so it's going to be sine of c or cosine of c and i don't really care how big c is right because sine of c and cosine of c what do you know about those values that they crank out they're always between negative one and one right less than or equal i guess okay so whatever value you plug in there, whatever C is, so wherever it's centered, whatever C value you're using, you know this is bounded between negative 1 and 1. On e to the x, we had a much bigger problem, right? We had this uh, 4 to the 18th, and we had this e to the 4th, or e to whatever power, right? But this e is no longer there. Now it's just 1, right? So what happens is rn turns into, well, the maximum, the worst case this could be is 1 over n plus 1 factorial. This 1 comes from the fact that the derivative is never going to be bigger than 1. And that's times, um, I guess, x minus a, whatever your x is and wherever your center doesn't matter, to the n plus 1. So the this, again, is going to grow slower than this. And this time we don't even have to deal with a, a big number up here, right? So this for sure is always going to 0. Why does this keep happening? Okay, so this thing is always going to zero for sine and cosine because it's a bounded function. Okay, and so for any bounded function, this is true. Okay, so any bounded function, if you know that it never goes above a certain value, then you, for sure the factorial is going to beat out that exponential every time. So any bounded function that you have, you know that that uh, remainder is going to go to zero and the function is going to converge for all real numbers. That's why sine and cosine converge so fast. All right, so what might AP ask? This has already been a pretty long video. Uh, you might have jumped right to here to see the solution to the AP problem. Um, but hopefully you were able to pick and choose the parts that you wanted uh, and, and be able to kind of get a good idea of what's going on with this. So what might AP ask? So this is one of the problems from the pink sheet. Looks like it's number three. Okay, so let f be a function that has derivatives of all orders. Wonderful. They give us f of 3, f prime of 3, f double prime, and f triple prime. That was very nice of them. We don't have to calculate them ourselves. And the graph of the fourth derivative uh, from 3 to 4 is shown right here. That might become, come in handy somehow because it's one derivative after the last one. Interesting. Okay, and they tell us that it is strictly increasing from 3 to 4. So it's going uphill. That must be important later. So first thing I want us to do is find the third degree Taylor polynomial. Well, let's just jump in and do that. Okay. Okay, so third degree Taylor polynomial centered at x equals 3. So that's going to be f of 3 plus f prime of 3 times x minus 3 plus f double prime of 3 times x minus 3 squared over 2 factorial. And then let's go to 3. So plus f triple prime of 3 times x minus 3 squared over 3 factorial. Okay, so let's just plug in the values. f of 3, they tell us, is 1. So this is 1. Uh, and then it'll be plus one half times x minus three. All right. And then the second derivative is negative one fourth. So it'll be plus negative one fourth. I'm just going to put them where they belong times x minus three squared over two factorial. And then the uh, third derivative is three eighths. So it'll be plus three eighths times x minus 3 squared over 3 factorial. Okay, so there's our third order uh, polynomial, and I might write it a little bit cleaner. So it's going to be 1 plus, let's just write it as x minus 3 over 2. 
Next one, we got negative one fourth over two. It's going to be negative. Uh, so let's do it minus. So we have minus uh, x minus 3 squared over 4 times 2 factorial is 8. 8 times 3 times 2 is 6. So we're going to have 48 on the bottom here. So we're going to have plus 3 times x minus 3 squared over 8 times 6 is 48. Okay, and there we go. So it's I like to clean it up like that because often later in the problem they ask you to plug in things, which is exactly what they're going to do next. Um, and it's just kind of nice to be able to do that. So if we evaluate this at x equals 3.7, because they want us to use this to approximate f of 3.7, so that's going to be 1 plus, so if I take 3.7 and subtract 3 each time, it's going to be 0. 0.7. So we 0. 0.7 squared over 2 minus 0. 0.7, oh, that's just 0. 0.7, not 0. 0.7 squared, my bad. So 0. 0.7 squared here, don't move, uh, over 8, and then it'll be plus... Um, 3 times 0.7 cubed, if I could do this right, that should be a 3. All these should be 3. Someone probably caught that and they said, Mr. Fransky, what are you doing? That should also be a 3. Close it and make it a 3. Okay, so we have 0.7 cubed over uh, 48. Let's go to our calculator and actually figure that out. Oh, not what I want. The calculator, there we go. <clears throat> Okay, so we have one, let's store 0.7 for x, I think that's going to be a good idea. So 0.7 store for x, and we're going to do 1 plus x over 2 minus x squared over 8, and then plus 3x to the third over 48. Gives me 1.31019. Okay, so that is our approximation. So we can say f of 3.7 is approximately equal to uh, 1.31019. Not perfect because we stopped our Taylor polynomial. I don't even know if this is in the range of things that are going to converge. Um, but that's what they asked us to do, is just find out what it's going to be. Okay? So we've got that number, 1.31019. I think that's going to be important. I'm going to write that down. 1.31019 is approximately f of 3.7. Okay, so now they say use the information from the graph to show that the uh, difference between the function and the polynomial is less than 0 0.08. So this was the polynomial value, right? This was p of 3.7. So what they're trying to show now is they want me to show that the error is less than 0 0.08. Well, I know the error. The error is going to be the next derivative, n plus 1, of some c value divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus uh, a, which in this case is 3, to the n plus 1. So they stopped us at 3, so this is going to be uh, evaluated at 4. So the fourth derivative of c divided by 4 factorial times x minus 3 to the fourth power. So now this is for some c that lives on the interval from 3 to 3.7. Okay, So somewhere between 3 and 3.7, there's a c value that um, makes this the exact error. But they want to show that it's less than a number, so it looks like I'm looking for a bound. Okay, so once again, I'm looking for the worst case scenario. I'm looking for the worst case scenario between 3 and 3.7. So what I need to know is what's going on with the fourth derivative. Well, we have a graph right here. Here's 3. Where's 3.7? Well, probably somewhere around here, right? So I want to know what is the biggest possible value of f4 of c. What is the biggest possible value um, that is going to uh, happen when I plug in a c value between 3 and 3.7 for the, the fourth derivative? Well, it looks like... When you plug in 3, you get a fourth derivative value of 2. I don't know what 3.7 is, right? It'd be nice if I did, because I could use it. But I know it's less than what number? Well, I know for sure it's less than 6, right? So I know the fourth derivative of c, because it's between 3 and 3.7, must be less than 6, right? So it's for sure less than 6. Hopefully that's going to be um, small enough to be able to make it less than 0.08. So I know that the error, which they just write a fancy way, so f of 3.7 minus p of 3.7, is for sure less than 6 over 4 factorial times the x value we're using is 3.7. So we're going to do 3.7 minus 3 to the fourth power. Okay, and let's figure out what that is. So if we plug that into our calculator, so I'm going to do 6 over 4 factorial, and then I'm going to multiply that by 0.7 to the 4th. So take that and multiply by 0.7, which is x. I could have just done that, to the 4th power. That gives me 0.06025. 0 
060025. So this tells me that the difference between the function value and the polynomial value that I use is for sure less than 0.060025. What did they want me to show it was less than? 0.08. Oh, for sure. That's less than 0.08. So I need to put a check mark, right? For sure, because I know the error is less than 0.06, so for sure it's less than 0.08. Now I'm going to try to squeeze this in at the bottom here. Could f of 3.7 be 1.283? Let's think about it. We plugged in 3.7, and what do we get? We got 1.31019. And we said the error was for sure less than what? We said, oh goodness, come back to me. Okay, well, we'll just open it up again. And go to the end. Sorry, this video has become far too long, and I feel like most of it is just me clicking around. There we go. Okay, so we know that um, that the worst possible error, the worst possible error for this could be 0.08, right? In fact, we know it's even smaller, but we know that the actual function value could be at most um, 0.08 off of there, right? Okay, so we know the actual function value, f of 3.7, has to be between what and what? It has to be between 1.31 minus 0.08 and 1.31 plus 0.08, because I know that the error is less than 0.08. Well, what's 1.31 minus 0.08? Let's see if we can think about that. That's like 1.23. And then over here, this would be like 1.39. So we know the function value has to be between those two numbers. What do they ask us for? 1.283. Absolutely, right? 1.283 lies within that interval because it's between 1.23 and 1.39. So yes, because we know that our error has, is off less than 0.08. Um, so, like, for example, it couldn't be, like, I don't know, like 1.16. Could it be 1.16? No, because that's more than 0.08 away from the value that we got, and we know our error is less than 0.08. All right, that's all I've got. It was a long one. Uh, hopefully, you were able to stick with me till the end, uh, or at least get the valuable information from here. Uh, that's it. That's all i got. I love you guys. That's why I'm here. Have a great day.